but but my 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 answer to Tarek is is in a way uh, my explanation of the Dutch case and, and the Bond's part. Um, it will not be as eloquent as Tarek, and uh, because I'm I'm going to read this uh, most of the text. And uh, and again, if you have any questions, interrupt me. And, the title of the book, the, the provisional title is Politics of Diversity, but it, it, this is just for me to remind myself what it's about. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, the book is uh, based on research I, uh, I carried out when I was also in Rotterdam. I was a, a postdoc at the, uh, the University of Rotterdam. Um, and my book will basically be uh, dealing with the Dutch situation in a kind of historical comparative perspective, but I will refer in the book to France and to the UK and to other countries in, in Europe, but, and also to Turkey, by the way. And I'll explain that uh, in a while. Um, why a book about the Dutch case? Because I think that the Dutch case is a very interesting case, not because we are here in the Netherlands, but because it is world famous. Everywhere you come, everybody knows about Geert Wilder, <coughs> Ishihari, or whatever. These kind of uh, uh, high-mediated, high-profile issues. And, but it, it, it very much triggers uh, uh, discussions about the things starting to uh, discuss. And I think it's, there is all reason to write a book about the Dutch case. So, the Netherlands is a small country with a relatively large proportion of Muslims, 6% of the population. That is, if you take all the people, uh, the, the, the statistics, the people with a Muslim background, of course, not people who, who practice Islam. But this, is, this figure is very important in the whole debate. We already have one million Muslims, mind you, you know. That, and recent developments, uh, as I said, such as the, uh, the murder on Theo van Gogh, the controversies around Tishi Ali, Geert Wilders, has made the Netherlands into a key country in the debate on Islam in Europe. Um, but I, but the, the reason why I, I'm, I'm writing this book is because I'm, I'm not very uh, pleased with the attention that is very much directed only to these, these, these cases and not which what is going on, much less visible and, and, and much more in a longer term, and that's the, the, the topic of my study. Um, my problem with many, there is of course, uh, the Netherlands has been dealt with in, uh, in all kinds of studies. My problem with many of these studies, however, is that they are inclined to treat the presence of Islam as a kind of new cultural effect. The arrival of Muslims, uh, it is argued, uh, leads to a growing cultural and ethnic diversity and poses a challenge to the existing social arrangements. This is misleading, that's my, my contention, when both the receiving societies and Muslim newcomers are treated as kind of static social categories and cultural and religious difference as self-evident objective differences. So cultural difference is, in my view, a, dic a discursive construct that takes on a particular form in a particular political and historical context. The idea of uh, cultural diversity as an actual or factual issue, a factual phenomena, is even dangerously misleading, I would say, when uh, the arrival of migrants with an Islamic background, one million people here, uh, is considered as a phase in a recurring encounter between the West and the Islamic world. Uh, a recent uh, cutting example is uh, Lewis, uh, Bernard Lewis, famous Orientalist. Historical treatment of this encounter in his recent book, What Went Wrong? Probably most of you are familiar with the book or not, I don't know. It's very instructive because what he says in the book, and he also um, explained that in, in interviews, um, he sees the activities of Muslims in Europe, for example, uh, trying to build a mosque or trying to open school or doing this or doing that um, and to set up their institution as the third attempt, as he said, uh, to capture Europe. The first was the seizure of Jerusalem in the 11th century. The second was the Ottoman conquest of European lands in the 16th and 17th century. So this is the, the, the immigration to Europe is the third encounter. 
this line of reasoning can be found in all kinds of analysis on radical Islam also, <coughs> following the bombings in London and, of course, 9 11. The idea, uh, but especially London, is, is instructive because the idea that terrorists are not any more zealots from uh, remote exotic countries like Afghanistan, but they are the blokes from next door. That's uh, really disturbing for <coughs> the neighbors with which you have an, an easy relation or probably a good relation. I don't know. That was also when Theo van Gogh was murdered. The most disturbing aspect was that he was murdered by a, a well-integrated, nice boy who did all kinds of nice things, and then suddenly he burst into a um, And this this kind of reasoning makes the the encounters in the way Lewis approaches is all the more ominous and compelling. And unfortunately, many people uh, buy to that image. We all know. In the Dutch populist right wing magazine Elsevier, for example, there was a year ago there was a longish article um, with a telling title, On Our Knees for Islam, in which all sorts of diverse events, Annelies was also quoted there, um, uh, and quotes are put together as the ultimate proof of this third encounter idea of this thesis. We can, of course, discuss this. A way of looking at things, but for now I consider this line of reasoning not only misleading, but also downright dangerous uh, and dangerously excluding. So it's, it's contrary to what, what Tarek just um, explained by the idea of multiculturalism. It completely neglects the utterly complex dynamics of culture and immigration and what I have coined as the economy of motives. But more importantly, it, it, it ignores the context of receiving countries as a crucial aspect of the analysis, and it treats, uh, treats Western European societies almost as victims of this third encounter. My basic argument in the book is that the particular trajectory that integration of Islam into European societies follows is first and foremost uh, uh, has something to do with the makeup of these receiving societies. Um, the specific characteristics of Islam, I dare say, does not matter at all. This is very strongly formulated but for the sake of the argument. If you want to understand these integration processes, society as a whole should be under scrutiny and not Islam, as, as always happened. Let me try to explain that in a kind of thesis and then, uh, and then try to elaborate that. The first one is uh, has to do with the uh, status of the nation state as a kind of central, in my view, very central issue. Despite these uh, globalizing tendencies and increasing transnational networks, the nation state is still and continues to be the most relevant political dimension and the most powerful political context for understanding the integration of Islam in Europe. I completely subscribe to the idea that identity politics do not automatically concur with the boundaries of the nation state and that there is both supranational, transnational but also local production of religious identities. More so, identity and place are no longer no longer linked to one another. My view, and that's that's some future research I'm 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 setting up now, the urban context as a condition rather than as a place is a much more promising dimension in that respect than the nation state. But to understand the implications of the arrival and integration of Islam and Muslims, I contend that the nation state is still the most powerful political entity uh, to understand this. In the literature on globalization, but also in the literature on migration, there is a reference to the so-called units problem in comparative social sciences. The main critique of many, of many studies on, on immigration and integration is that these studies often presume culture, society, and the nation state as a kind of real existing structurally bounded entities that explain and determine social positions and subjectivities. Again, to a large extent I subscribe to that critique. Contexts are often taken for granted as self-evident without a critical analysis of what context implies, and my, my book will be about that context. Sometimes the nation state is referred to as a locus of grand meta-narratives about toleration, integration, or secularization. Secularism. 
In other instances, the nation state becomes a locus or the cradle for development of an imagined community, a shared cultural, political, identificatory project. This is well captured by the work of Ben Anderson, who frames the nation in terms of common will, common fate, and above all, uh, synchronicity. I'm not going very deeply into that because it's, it's, it's a bit of a different matter. But Anderson refers to the nation as a deep horizontal comradeship of a particular group of people, which is beyond history in a way. It's, it's what he calls empty time. It's an, an empty, a timeless space, so to speak. Um, so, some have particularly criticized his rather dehistoricizing approach to the nation and argue that the nation state is but a historical phase um, and sometimes it's the last phase or it's, it's, it's in, in his last phase and um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a new phase uh, to be emerging. Despite the problematic and complex nature of the, of the concept of nation, I argue that the arrival of Muslims, as I said before, takes place um, in, an, in an era in which nation state is the prime political entity. Um, and there is there's two ways in which this plays an important role. One is when we understand when we want to understand how Muslims find their place in society, we need to look first and foremost to the national political context. Um, both local and supranational arrangement can always and ultimately be overruled by political decision making, making at the national level. In the Netherlands we find the numerous examples of this political balance. It will take years, I contend, before Brussels will overrule national member state, <coughs> states in issues of culture and religion. And secondly, and probably more interestingly however, is the increasing role of national states as active agents in cultural politics. In almost all countries in Europe we see a nationalist backlash following 9-11. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with the Dutch case, there is an abundance of evidence uh, that shows how massive critique of multiculturalist politics is wrapped in a discourse on national identity and national values and decency, uh, Balkan ending, or historical canons or um, uh, societal, so, social, uh, social scientific uh, canons. And we see similar uh, developments elsewhere in Europe. And I contend that the, the nation state plays a very active role in aging in this. There is an interesting paradox here. On the one hand, there is an increasing uh, tendency towards liberalization and state withdrawal. So liberalism is still on the rise and nests itself in state institutions. But at the same time, the liberal state is disseminating visions about citizenship, cultural homogeneity and a regulation of religion that are much more demanding and compelling than before. Especially liberals uh, are asking for more state intervention in religious affairs to control religion, especially Islam. And well, if you have followed the discussion last evening on television, you know what I'm talking about. Which discussion was that? The, the, the discussion on the, 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 the Liberal Party and uh, was emphasizing that... Uh, Perhaps that we have some more okay. national... Well, the, 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 liberal, the Liberal Party, the the VVD, the VVD, is, is uh, emphasizing right over and right. over again... Conservative Party. Yeah. Right-wing Liberals. Okay. 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 We have three liberal parties, yeah. center, <laughs> left, and right. The, 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 the liberal spectrum, let's put it like that. They, this is paradoxical, they are emphasizing more control on, on religion. Which is interesting. We can discuss that. Um, so citizens, that's, that's, that's part of it. Citizens should be educated according to an envisioned secular mode of citizenship. <laughs> Um, and the, 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 the mandatory participation, for example, in citizenship rituals by newcomers uh, presents itself almost as a conversion ritual. A colleague of mine is uh, doing very interesting research about it. He shows how this, 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 this ritual, you have to go there if you want to be uh, to become Dutch, this is like a conversion, a conversion to Dutch. Or whatever. 
So to conclude, it would be misleading uh, to argue that the nation state is in its final hour and it continues to be very powerful. Okay, then I come to my second hypothesis. As I already uh, noticed, the way Muslims uh, are, the, the way Muslims are treated and the characteristics of integration trajectories uh, reflect the logics of the nation state uh, and its prevailing political culture rather than with an actual existing religious difference. So, as I said, this particular characteristics of, of this particular religion are less important or even non-important in understanding how this integration evolves. Um, this has to do with the ways in which a nation state deals with religious diversity and how they perceive of themselves vis-a-vis -vis others. Whatever we think of the presence of Muslims, it is clear that the developments with respect of Islam, both within Europe and in the world at large, have challenged the character of the Western European nation states. And it's a widespread misunderstanding that Western European nation states are accomplished, that they are built and ready, so to speak. And the fundamental formative episodes, that's the idea lay back more than a century and a half uh, ago and their status quo need not, so to speak, be reconfirmed. Um, as we know from the literature, and there's, there's, there's really interesting literature about that, um, even established nation states like the Netherlands have to um, reconfirm and reenact themselves on a daily basis. There's all kinds of examples about that. And the hegemonical discourses and, and narratives about the nation must be retold over and over again. And the very image of Muslims as arriving in an accomplished nation state is part of that hegemonical discourse by which Muslims are a priori excluded from becoming part of the nation as Muslims. And again, that's what something was tried to refer to already. So although there is, may, uh, may be a lot of similar issues that ask for similar solutions in most immigrant countries in Europe, the specific way in which these issues are framed, how that diversity is made into a political challenge and articulated with political decision making, largely reflects the dominant national political culture. And this political culture is the outcome, uh, I argue, uh, of previous political struggles and to a large extent structures the debate. It, it, it offers a repertoire. Two aspects are particularly relevant. First is the national narrative. And second is political culture as an actual political repertoire. First, a few words about his national narrative. When did I start? Well, you have another 25 minutes. Okay. Um, first is national narrative. A crucial element in uh, political cultures is the narrative about the nation and kind of national myth. As such, it's a story of the nation about itself. A grand narrative about the past, the present, and the future. And a very important aspect of the national myth is that it's hegemonic. Uh, it's the it's core of ideas and claims that most citizens accept about the nation state beyond their political divisions. That's more or less kind of a definition about this hegemonical status. Uh, Irrespective of our difference, we all know and we know that it is like this and that. And <coughs> there is something like that. It, it's very hard to, to uh, grasp that, to, to make sense of it, but, but it's, it's, it's there. These national history, histories are, of course, contested and rewritten over and over again. So it's not a static issue, but they co shape dominant discourses and have such a certain durability and effect. Um, textbook, history textbooks here, and again, uh, Tarek already uh, referred to that, are an excellent source for the analysis of national imaginaries. And as a matter of fact, I did research there uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we did research in a couple of countries, and, and, and one of the parts of the research was to look at how in, in, in secondary school textbooks, uh, nation states talk about themselves about nation. To what extent history is national history? It's, it's framed in a way about the nation. 
it's a very selective look if you look at those uh, that history. It's a very selective look at um, uh, is presented about the nation's past, taking up what is considered necessary in understanding the present and omitting what is considered irrelevant. Uh, in Dutch case, we have this well, rather uh, edgy example of um, the, um, uh, the the last years of the Indonesian uh, colonization, which is completely omitted in many history books, which is interesting. It's not talked about. It's like when we talk about Indonesia, we talk about uh, nice meals, etc., etc. In history, it's really interesting. And we leave out what is edgy and what is problematic. Um, so. This national history is about what the, the, the nation stands for and uh, which should be transmitted from one generation to the next. Um, this is of course not a reality. This is how it should be. It is after all a narrative. Um, so what about this Dutch dominant narrative with respect to cultural and religious diversity? Um, interestingly, and I think here is a difference with Britain, at least uh, until recently. That is, that society is conceived of as individuals, so not collectivities, individuals with a different lifestyle, different opinions, different backgrounds. And what counts is the fact that there is diversity of all sorts, and more importantly, how to deal with this diversity. And diversity is a challenge. It's not something with enrichment is not very interesting. It's about a challenge. We have to cope with difference. We have to do something with it. Um, we have seen that in the past, so, so the story goes. Um, but we are able to overcome that. We are able to overcome uh, recurring, continuous flows of difference, new differences coming to our country and, and, and challenging our institutions, etc. But we can do that, no problem. We did that in the past and we can do that in the future. Um, the implication of all is that the Netherlands managed to organize a peaceful cohabitation of religious minorities not by making an issue of difference, but rather to play them low key. By adopting tolerance as a basic attitude. And religion is in a way conceived of as a matter of opinion. Some people believe in God and others believe in social all the same. Um, culture as a matter of subculture and lifestyle ethnicity as a matter of background. Diversity in terms of religion, culture, ethnicity uh, thus uh, is treated as an individual option. The collective rights which figure so prominently in the British concept of multicultural at least until recently are not foreseen in this construction. Uh, and recent events, so the story goes, we have fallen, uh, uh, recent events such as 9-11, it's not in the Netherlands, but of course there, there is a backlash, but let's take the, the murder of David van Gogh, um, has fallen upon us from outside. And that's the problem. And now we have to deal with it. And so we have no part in it. It's just something that came to us. It's very interesting if you look at the way the Second World War is treated in this history. It's much the same. We were a peaceful country and then the Nazis came and we were disturbed and after, and, and after the Second World War we took up the, the course we had and we continued. That's the way it's, it's, uh, it's still um, uh, told. <coughs> um, Okay, so that's one. That's the, that's the narrative, and this narrative, I think, is very important in understanding how repertoires and negotiations uh, are uh, developed. The second, uh, the second relevance of the, the nation as a context has to do with uh, uh, the, of, uh, of political culture has to do with the political culture as a repertoire in contentious politics. So political culture not only refers to the dominant discourse and that narrative, but also to political processes itself. And when we look at the abstract principles such as separation of church and state, secularization, freedom of speech, neutrality of the public sphere, and the ways in which it has been applied in concrete situations, it becomes clear that these principles can only be understood 
in concrete contested issues such as head scar debates, uh, education, houses of worship, uh, issues of loyalty, etc. With real political actors. So it's not something that is just above us, but it's something that you can only uh, distinguish in real politics, in real negotiations. So, because that's the level where actual decision uh, making uh, is uh, being taken and, and identities are articulated. Religious newcomers are involved in emancipation processes. <laughs> Um, uh, where was Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, religious newcomers are involved in emancipation processes. It's a struggle to get access to resources. In my contention, uh, nation building is first and foremost a process stained by political collective action, by struggle. So, again, if we want to know more about this repertoire, the way in which this happens, we have to look at the struggle. And and the word struggle is, for many people, sounds very, well, very, uh, uh, in a way, as if it's all about a fight. But I think that that this is negotiations are struggles. So there is in history, uh, especially in the Netherlands, there is no the whole idea about toleration is as if the uh, the um, integration of religious minorities was something that was very. Was, fluid and was something that without any any problem but Dutch history also shows that it's always a matter of political fight, always a matter of political struggle. <coughs> so we have to look and concentrate on the struggle. Um, then political culture as I see it can be considered as an argumentative repertoire and relate that an, uh, the available political language that political actors have at their disposal. There are, of course, other discourses, but the dominant one has proven to be the most effective to meet demands in situations where there is inequality of power. Or, to put it differently, it is of vital importance to master the societal skills in the dominant society and to understand the appropriate language. Let me give you one example, which took place a couple of years ago um, in a debate where I took place, and there was also uh, uh, one of the... Um, uh, the leaders of the Arab European League um, and it was a debate with the Christian Democrat Party and then this, uh, this, uh, this member of the, of the Arab European League uh, said uh, when they were discussing uh, freedom of religion etc etc multiculturalism and these kind of issues then he suddenly spoke about uh, sovereignty in one own set and this is for the Dutch people a very familiar Phrase it's, uh, in Dutch it said souvereiniteit in eigen kring, which is a typical Protestant creed of well, there should be a kind of room for, yeah, for, autonomy, for autonomy or whatever. And so, if you refer to that history, then the people, at least the people of the Christian Democrat Party, very well understand what you mean by that. So, it's taking up in a way, it's taking up the political repertoire of the others. To make your claim more uh, effective, and I think that's that's interesting. There's an abundance of, of uh, uh, examples like this. Um, let me see. Um, so it's my contention to end up this this part um, that political culture very much sets the agenda for negotiations. But the outcome, and I think that's very important, the outcome of these negotiations are principally unpredictable. Let me again give an example, a very famous example. The, um, uh, often the Dutch polarization of Zuiling in the Netherlands um, is often portrayed, conceived of as uh, the result of Dutch toleration. Probably Dutch people among the audience know, probably know, uh, well, why why did we have a polarized uh, political system? Because that was the way we put religious toleration into practice because the Netherlands was such a plural country and how to deal with that, as I said before. So it was a way to accommodate and pacify uh, the, 
extreme religious diversity of the country. This is, uh, in my view, his, uh, reading history backwards. So what you do is you say, well, this is the result. We have a polarization. And how come? What's the reason why we have this polarization? But it should be the other way around. And I think that's much more instructive. We should not look at the result, but we should look at the process itself, the negotiation. And if you look at the documents, and that's what I did for my research, there is nowhere that is a reference to something like polarization in the end of the 19th century, in the, in the days of the school struggle. Nobody referred to Versailles. Nobody, no, nobody had that idea of resiling in mind, but that's what is interpreted now today. And this is what I said. It is kind of a reading history backwards. And the Article 23 in the Constitution, the article on which school, uh, the, the, the school <coughs> free, it's about school freedom. It's not about resiling. It's about freedom of. It's about autonomy. Um, and this, of course, sets the agenda, if you take education uh, as an issue, it sets the agenda for negotiations today. But again, you should be very careful to say, well, pillarization is a typical, is a kind of, uh, is in the, in the genes of the Dutch society, the genes of the Dutch nation, and it comes out wherever, uh, wherever you want to. And it's strange because it's this verzuiling where many uh, critics today, uh, with respect to the integration of Islam in the Netherlands, point at. They say, well, this is the big problem. This verzuiling uh, is the big problem. And I think there is no, there, there, there is no way that we can, that we can understand uh, the discussion about schools today uh, by just saying, well, this is typically Dutch, and, uh, period. So, of course, there is the verzuiling or the legislation is very important to understand why there are schools, but it's not enough. You should look at the process, you should look at negotiations taking place, and then you will see <coughs> these schools were not there suddenly. So, okay, there is legislation and we can set up schools. Okay. So, my third kind of thesis. I is may have to ask you to yeah. be brief yeah. and concentrate specifically, if you if there is, yeah. on, on the secularization debate. Secular. Yeah, well, this, this is uh, partly about the secularization debate. Uh, well, if, if you can try and engage yeah. a little bit explicitly with the things that have been said by the time. Yeah, yeah, well, but. <laughs> uh, if you if you if you don't mind, I I, I just want to I think that these 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 points will be dealt with, but but not very explicitly. Um, so my, my my third contention is that um, the integration of Islam, the integration of Islam, does not exist. So of course everyone would acknowledge that negotiations about schooling or religious education follow a different course than those about for example, building a mosque. But I argue that these different issues produce different collective actors and different problem definitions, different negotiation processes, and not least, different discourses on religious diversity and religious identity. So to put it differently, and that's probably an answer to your question, uh, what about secularization? I think that a general discussion about the relation between state and religion or society and religion cannot be given unless you, you break up uh, these issues into very specific uh, particular fields in which this, uh, this contesta uh, contestation takes place. Um, okay. So which kind of themes and issues come up uh, depends largely on historically grown differences in political culture, as I have explained. And we cannot understand why, for example, education is such, such a central issue in the Dutch case by simply assuming that education is important for Muslims, as often is claimed. Um, the saliency of this issue has historic roots in Dutch nation building. And again, I think that's part of the specific uh, relation between church and state in the Netherlands. In my book, I distinguish four main themes and try to analyze the particular Dutch way 
these themes are dealt with and negotiated. So one of these themes is the politics of education. I have said something about it. And I will leave it for now and concentrate on the, the other uh, three issues. One is politics of space. The other is public sphere. And the, the, the fourth one is royalty. Um, politics of space. Loyalty. 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 Yeah. Issues of loyalty. So the acquisition of places of worship uh, plays a very important role uh, in religious emancipation. Religious groups, whether minorities or majorities, have always prioritized organizing the room for prayer. And although political empowerment, organizational activity, and legal arrangements are crucial landmarks in the emancipation of religious outsiders, the symbolic significance of places of worship cannot be overstated, estimated. And places of worship, especially when they have built for, uh, for uh, purposely built, in a way objectify religious presence. They are prime signifiers of the process of localization of religious uh, newcomers. But these places of worship have also been crucial instruments with which the state have exerted control over religious subjects, since they materialized religious presence. Um, so, places of worship has always triggered debates about uh, the character of the public space, the historical character of the public space, and who owns public space. Um, and here again, the state has a very interesting role. The, the Dutch state has played a very interesting role. Um, there are several moments in Dutch history, in Dutch political history, uh, where visible houses of prayer did play a crucial role in the relation between the state and religion. First, of course, in the Golden Age, when the building of physical Catholic churches was forbidden, and we have the so-called hidden churches. <coughs> Second, during the liberal years in the mid-19th century, when this ban was lifted, uh, the, the ban on, on building uh, Catholic churches, um, well, physical Catholic churches, and Catholics who built uh, their churches, there was mushrooming uh, of uh, building activities and fierce reactions by Protestants. And these were very similar to the reactions today about mosque building. They should be not too high, and you know, the, 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 the church tower should be. And always there was a, there was a um, there was a demand uh, towards the state to interfere in the process. So, well, the shades the state should control this process. So the analysis and of contestations uh, to establish places of worship can thus provide us with a clue about religious freedom, but also about the historization and the appropriation of space. Um, so most negotiations, for example, about the building of mosques in the Netherlands are typically examples of what I have called soft interface. And again, here, this is a very interesting aspect of the relation between church and state in the Netherlands. Most of these uh, negotiations take place invisible. So it's kind of uh, negotiations between employees of a municipality and, and local organizers of a mosque. And nobody hears, and, and the media do not, do not take notice. Um, so they are accomplished low profile by local negotiation with municipalities uh, are hardly uh, and, and, and the, 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 uh, they are hardly mentioned in the press. One very interesting aspect here is that again in this kind of low profile negotiations the state has subsidized quite some number of mosques in the Netherlands and many people do not know that. Um, after the Second World War, there was a law which said, well, buildings, uh, houses of worship that had been destroyed during, during the Second World War uh, could be rebuilt with the help of the state. And so there was this law, it was called the Law on Church Building, something like that. So it, it was very much designed for churches. But then, since this law was formulated in such a way that there was no clear kind of reference to, to churches. Yeah. 
um, um, th there was no, no clear reference. Mm -hmm. um, most organizations could uh, make use of that law, and there are some examples of mosques being built in the Netherlands with subsidies by the state. Well, if that th this 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 law has been abolished, uh, I think in the early 1980s. But if something would happen today, of course, it would be an enormous hype, and people would say, "Well, it's imp impossible that the state should interfere in." In, in, in most building activities. But again, if you look at, at negotiations, these invisible negotiations, you see that the state, the local state, plays an enormous uh, important role in, in, in facilitating, subsidizing, what kind of ways they, they help uh, with building mosques still and continues to be so. The other point, and that's for, for, for lack of time, the other point I, I want to, uh, to uh, refer to here is public sphere. And I think that again uh, has bears some relevance to the issue of secularism. Um, and it has much to do with this idea of neutrality of the state. And this is a hot issue, neutrality of the state, for over 150 years in this country. Neutrality of the state was the very interpretation of, of this principle for which the school struggle in the 19th century broke out. It was not about plurality, as I said, it was about neutrality. The liberal politicians in the second half of the century interpreted this concept of free, religious, uh, free of religious influence. That was the idea. So neutrality, as Starek also explained, is the idea of Having being impartial, having no no play no role in religious affairs, and of course this is still applied by most liberals today. In the Dutch case, there was a, a, a rivaling interpretation adopted by the Protestants, who considered neutrality um, uh, as a religion free of state interference. So, as you probably know, the, the Free University in Amsterdam, the, the reason that it's called the Free University is because it, it means free from the state. The state cannot interfere in, uh, in university uh, affairs. The, art, the, the agreements that were reached in the 1920s, later resulting in Fasaudi, <coughs> can be depicted not as a Dutch brand of multiculturalism, as is often argued, but as the Dutch version of state neutrality. Neutrality was used here in the sense of power balance. Uh, where the same kind of struggle in France, for example, resulted in a total victory of the secularists in 1985, 1905, sorry. <laughs> in the Netherlands, the neutrality could only be reached by parity and equal representation, because the plural character of the Dutch society. This is at least the interpretation that has been given to the <coughs> One of the main results was that the legislation on education, uh, as I as I refer to, um, uh, uh, have to do with, again, has to do with this neutrality. But neutrality has in, in, in recent years shifted from educational issues much more to per performativity, appearance, representation, and impartiality in the strict sense of the word. In my book, uh, I therefore concentrate on headscarf affairs. Because I think there are good examples, and I'm always almost finished. There are good examples of how certain principles concerning state neutrality are applied in a great variety of situations. So generally speaking, there are two issues at stake with respect to that scarf. The first is the crucial question whether the veil is a sign of lack of impartiality. So a woman wearing a veil is biased in her observations as against a woman who does not wear a veil. The second question is whether the veil is a proof of suppression by male, or in other words, a sign of failing integration. That are the two ways in which headscarves are discussed in this country. In both cases, I argue, there is a strong reference to pedagogies and to a personal requirement attached to citizenship. So proper citizen that proper citizenship is not a specific moral, is a specific moral disposition of the self. Proper citizens dispose of certain skills and competences that should be learned and trained. 
women with headscarves do apparently not dispose of these skills. And the veil is a proof of their lack of knowledge and competence about the society. And they should be educated better. That's the, that's the, the message behind that. So neutrality is, is more a personal disposition than a formal arrangement. If you, if you are neutral, this is a kind of a personal disposition. It's, it's a skill. It's not a formal arrangement, it's a skill. And I think that's a very important aspect of the Dutch way of treating neutrality. And it's different, it's different from France, where headscarves, where the headscarf is almost completely a formal issue, something that has to do with uh, separation of church and state, etc. Um, so there was there's one, one interesting example here in the Netherlands a couple of years ago where a, and, and Annelies Morris has written an article about it, um, where, a, where a woman with a headscarf um, applied for a job as a deputy judge. And she was refused on the grounds that she could not, because she had this headscarf, she could not act as a neutral judge, as somebody who was able to to, uh, well, to balance and to, to take decisions properly. In the whole discussion, there is no reference to Catholics or to Protestants or to other religions. It's only for Muslims. And this is very interesting because it very, there is a striking similarity. And that's what I try to explain in my book with the discussion in the beginning of the 20th century about women entering the public arena, the political arena. How could a woman take part in a rational debate? How could she keep her professional impartiality? That was the, the issue at stake uh, some hundred years ago. And it's, it's, it's pretty much the same when we see the discussions on headscarves. It's about a personal disposition. Yeah. Um, so there seems strange, and that's, that's, that's my, my conclusion for this part, and then I leave it. Uh, with that. There seems to be a very strange paradox in the liberal logic when it concerns issues of visibility, representation, and performance. On the one hand, there is an emphasis on the rational speech rather than on presence, on the what instead of the who. And the liberal understanding of neutrality of the public sphere shows what Nancy Fraser has once called wrecking social status. It is the message that counts and not the messenger. But on the other hand, and that's interesting here in the discussion about headscarves is that the same liberal logic demands an almost complete eradication of the visual diversity from the public sphere. So if you, have a, uh, if you wear a headscarf, you are not neutral. You cannot take part in a rational debate because you are different. Thus it's, it is rather emphasizing social status than bracketing social status. And this contradiction we it requires a thorough reconsideration, I would argue, of the characteristics of the public sphere and the conditions under which this uh, excess occurs. So, I think I leave it with that, and I leave royalty, and we, we can discuss that later on in education. Yes? Yeah? Okay, okay, thank you, Dad.